How are you? Hello. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have uh, you. It is late, hey? It's it's getting late. First, you know, I'm a dad now, so uh, for me, it's it's pretty late. I have to take my kid to school tomorrow, so. But it's okay. I, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to have you. And you guys just played Coachella. It's a um, it's an interesting time to play Coachella, right? Because back in 2016, you guys were the first major Korean group to play the festival, and now you're back this year. Like, how was it? Can you compare and contrast the first time and this time? Uh, definitely, a lot has changed over the years. But I, I guess the biggest difference is that this is the uh, first big festival after uh, more than two years of COVID, you know, so uh, a lot of pent up energy. Um, I could see that the crowd had been waiting for this moment where uh, they could be side by side with other people just like them and just enjoy themselves. So um, just very good vibes all, overall. It was really good. How did it, how did it feel on stage? Feel good? I felt amazing. And for the second weekend, my daughter actually uh, flew in for it. And it's actually her first time seeing me on a big stage like that. So, um, you know, it, I, I went extra hard on that one. How old is she? Uh, she's 12. She just turned 12. So what did she think? What did she think when she saw her dad on stage? Uh, so afterwards I saw like a video of, that my manager shot of her enjoying the show. And it's just, I, I can't describe it in words. It's, it's very special to see someone that you love, um, that much, uh, love you back in that kind of way. Yeah. So, um, just, just, you know, seeing something spark in her eyes, I don't know if she's going to do music. I don't know if she's going to be an entertainer, but whatever she does, I'm hoping that whatever she saw that night, um, you know, helps her along the way, like inspires her in some way. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to talk about this story I want to talk to you about today, about everything you went through. I'm trying to figure out where to start here because it's such a, <laughs> a big story. And I think your daughter is probably a good place to start. Like you first start realizing something is wrong, something is different when you post that your daughter is born, right? Yeah, like, um, so while my wife was pregnant and, uh, you know, obviously I wasn't really paying attention to the internet. I didn't have time for that. So uh, I was focused on what was going on in the house. And once my uh, daughter was born, um, I went on Twitter to say, you know, to announce that my daughter um, is healthy. And uh, I thought that people would be congratulating me. And some were, but um, a lot of the posts were uh, just unbelievably menacing. And I was sh obviously shocked. Uh, trying to figure out what was going on. And, and I, I had realized that something huge had um, brewed up and uh, had taken over uh, the internet by that point. And um, yeah, from that, from that moment on, it was just relentless for the next couple of years. Let, let, let me tell people what the what the something huge that brewed up was. There, there were these like pretty intense, I mean, extremely intense rumors and message boards and groups um, all alleging that you lied about graduating from Stanford University, the, the Ivy League College in California, alleging that you forged your diploma diplomas, which is not only a crime in Korea, but was was kind of in the news then as well. When you first heard the rumors that you had forged your your diplomas from Stanford, what goes through your mind? What's your reaction? Well, a few years prior, um, someone had uh, tried to like speculate on that, uh, th like two three years before that. So when that happened, uh, I had already verified once. So. I honestly thought that it was ridiculous, but um, it it escalated very, very quickly. So it started with um, doubts 
as to whether or not I had really gone to Stanford. Uh, and then it quickly turned into something where people were having doubts about my identity altogether. Uh, and then it snowballed into accusations that I had killed someone to take their identity. Uh, and then it affected every single member of my family. Uh, and then it quickly spilled out into real life. So uh, my brother lost his job. Uh, people came to my mom's. Uh, she has a hair salon and they came to her workplace um, pretending to be with the authorities, harassing her, threatening her, uh, got death threats uh, over the phone. Uh, it, it, it just happened so quickly and so frighteningly fast that uh, it, it was just a constant moment of shock stretched out over like years. I can't imagine it. Like, I can't imagine having those sort of rumors happen because it also becomes like front page news, right? It also becomes like the top lead story. And I should point out, like, <laughs> you're already really famous at this point, right? Like, your music career yeah. is going really, really well at this point. Like, yeah, well, something that I, I realized uh, when this happened was that being famous uh, and being infamous uh, it's it's like one switch, right? And yeah. when that switch is flicked on, uh, it, it's like a wildfire. Uh, becoming famous takes a long time. Becoming infamous is instantaneous. And when it happens, for some reason, it, it burns a lot faster and a lot brighter uh, than than fame. What strikes me about that is that you still can't go out. I mean, you were you were essentially like trapped in your home. Like you couldn't go anywhere. I technically could, but the problem was that um, people had like picket signs in the street protesting uh, my my existence, basically, and demanding that I either leave the country or I kill myself. So it was frightening to go out. For example, like. Sometimes I would have to go to the hospital because my daughter, as I said, was was an infant at yeah, the time. Yeah. So um, she would have to go to the hospital once in a while for checkups or for whatever was required. And I would go there and I would not know uh, because, because you have to realize a lot of people were in, in this uh, Internet movement. Yeah. And, and they were all anonymous online, but they all had jobs and were living normal lives within the society, right? So I, I would go to the hospital and not know if the doctor who's injecting, you know, like my child with a needle is a member of this, of this movement. There, there was just no way to know. And... The scary thing is when once we caught um, some of these people and they went, they eventually went to jail. But I think one or two of them were actually doctors. So my fears were legitimate, which which is a very very scary thing. Here's what I find interesting about this: is that at one point, and I'm not surprised by this, at one point you start to doubt yourself. You start to go. Did I? Did I go to Stanford? Yeah, it, it was. It wasn't that I was doubting. Uh, just things like that. It was when you have like an entire world of people um, claim something about you and uh, just constantly reinforce uh, what they believe upon you. Uh, even though you know what really happened, um, you, you start, like your whole concept of reality starts getting warped. It, where sometimes you'll think to yourself, hey, I, I really wish it was true because if it, if it is true, then you know, I, you know, my life can just end and 
yeah. we can get over with, you know, this can all end. Yeah. But, but you can't do that because, I mean, it's not the truth and you have to fight it. But at times I would really like, I would just like wonder, like they're saying that I made all this up. They're saying that I lived a false life. Uh, it's either all of them are crazy or I'm crazy, you know? Yeah. And it's just a it's just a frightening place to be. It, but it's a trauma response, it sounds like to me. Like, it sounds like when you undergo such intense trauma, it's natural for your body and for your brain to to try to try and accept it, to try and doubt yourself, to try and wonder if you're wrong or something like that. Like, it sounds like it's, it's just a response to intense. And people might not think that online communities and that conspiracy theories can have real traumatic effects on, on the people at the center of them, but they, I mean, it really can. Yeah, it definitely can. Um, something that kind of surprised me uh, as this podcast was being put together, yeah. um, Vice did an amazing job. They went very in depth with their research, with their investigation. And when I was listening to the episodes, there were things that I didn't know, like, or I didn't remember. Yeah. So uh, when I was going through that whole period, I think there are moments that I kind of, you know, put, put away into a shelf somewhere in my mind so that I wouldn't have to think about it. And as I was listening, like sometimes it felt like I was listening to a story about someone else. And I think that's just how I, my, my brain protected itself um, during that whole process. And at the time you're still, you're still making music. Like you're going through all of this. There's some, there's some closure and that people are going to jail and you're cleared. It's still, I mean, incredibly traumatic to you. And you're still trying to do your day job of making a solo record. Like what is that, what is, what is that time like for you when you think back on it? Uh, I actually wasn't making the music to be released. Okay. Uh, for, for quite a long time, I actually didn't make any music. I couldn't write. I couldn't really do anything. Uh, except fight this and uh, or I would just be sitting at home unable to you know, basically just mentally paralyzed and uh, my wife recommended that I continue to write so that yeah you know I, I think she she realized that if I didn't um, it, it I would be in danger uh, yeah. and so, so I, I did it like I'm writing a journal and um, just went to the studio once in a while just to record it as I would if I'm writing a journal. And, it's, you know, things worked out and eventually the music came out and people got to hear it. But, um, yeah, I, I don't think I intended it to be heard. For a long time, you didn't talk about this thing that you went through. What made you want to start talking about it? Yeah, so this is still kind of going on. Really? Under the surface. Yeah, there's like, uh, there's Tajinyo. This was Tajinyo. Uh, now it's like Tajinyo 3 or, f I don't know, 2, 3, 4. Yeah, this is, the um, this is the message board that is doing all the alleging and doing all of this sort of like uh, uh, conspiracy yeah. Theory stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, I still see it once in a while, um, hear about it once in a while. It's, it's all under the surface now because, you know, they, they've been debunked, but some people just won't give up. So it's, yeah, like, so as time passed, I, I didn't want to put my family through this just constantly. Yeah. You know, and my wife and just my whole family went through so much during those years that, um, you know, I, I didn't want them to be involved with any more negativity. And um, so so I, I didn't want to talk about it. Uh, it. It's just like a chapter in my life that I wanted to remain closed. But my daughter is now she just turned 12 and 
Um, she's got the internet, you know, she's got the phone in her hands. She's got YouTube. She's, she can pretty much Google anything. So this is going to pop up and her friends might find it. Uh, her friend's parents might find it. And eventually this conversation will come up and I wanted her to get the story from me uh, and get the full story uh, in an objective way so that, see, here's the thing. When this happened to me back in the day, that's like how many years ago? Like 11, 12 years ago? Yeah, 12, 13 years ago, yeah. Yeah, 12, 13 years ago. It was the first time something like this had happened. Now we're living in 2022 where uh, weird conspiracy theories, uh, snowballing is a common thing, right? Yeah. Uh, none of us would be surprised or shocked by it. Uh, but back then, it just had never happened, like globally. It was not something that was a common phenomenon. Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't have like a, a, a story to go to, to get help from. Like there was no prior case for me to look at. And I don't know, maybe, maybe like find some consolation. I literally had to fight something that had never happened. And it was very lonely and very scary. And now that my daughter and also my fans and my friends, they're living in a world where it can happen to them at any point. Uh, I just wanted there to be a story um, for them to go to that would help them. Are you are you still on social media? Like, oh, I mean, I've seen your presence on social media. I know you're on there, but does it change your relationship yeah. with social media? Uh, so I stayed away from social media for a while, but then... Uh, I realized that if every single person that is positive uh, or, you know, fun, enjoyable, uh, leaves Twitter or leaves social media because they are getting pushed out by the negativity, then there is no one there to counter the, the darkness or the negativity, right? Right. So I decided to, you know, stay there and I decided to uh, be as positive as possible, um, to be fun, to, to try to counter that, you know, and it's, it, it took a while, but now I'm, I'm like up there, you know, posting memes and <laughs> You know, every once in a while, someone will diss me or say something mean, but I'll sometimes I'll res respond to it with like a meme or, um, you know, just turning it into something, something positive. Man, oh man, this is like such an unbelievable story. And what's what's unbelievable is how it, I mean, is the story that people would accuse you of falsely going to the school or saying that you didn't graduate and it would snowball and you wouldn't be able to leave your house. What's believable is the courage you have shown through this whole thing, the bravery and still talking about it um, and hoping that it might not happen to people in the future or they might have an example to learn from through you, to give yourself up as an example. It's, um, it's powerful stuff. Thanks so much for talking to us today. No, thank you for uh, you know, allowing me to be on your platform like this. It's my pleasure. We're going to play Super Rare. Oh, awesome. What, what should we know about it before we play it? Uh, it's one of, uh, my favorite songs on the uh, latest album. Uh, it's, it's what the title says. Like, I believe every single person in the world is, uh, is a work of art and is super rare. And, uh, as long as you know that no matter how many people say otherwise, you're going to be fine. <laughs> 